So what you do is very sensible. You emphasize and upweight those areas of the experience where you have a comparative advantage. And train travel in terms of enjoyment and productivity um, undoubtedly wins. Hello, intelligent beings of this marvelous planet. Welcome to the 42 Courses podcast and thanks for listening. Today, Rory Sutherland is here speaking with his co-author Pete Dyson about their new book, Transport for Humans, Are We Nearly There Yet? The book's about how engineers plan transport systems, but it's people that use them. We might consider habit, status, comfort, variety, and many other factors that engineering equations don't capture at all. Now, with climate change, the pandemic, and changing work life priorities, the time is right for a new way forward. And this book maps out how to design transport for humans. So, his 42 Courses founder, Chris Rawlinson, to ask the questions to Pete Dyson and Rory Sutherland. Perfect. Done. Ready. Excellent. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so yeah, I'll just start. Uh, Rory, Pete, so lovely to, to chat again. Um, <laughs> what an honor and congratulations on the uh, upcoming book. Very excited to... Uh, to yeah, talk. yeah. I, 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 unfortunately, it's a very problematic time to have written the book because shortly after the book was published, I went and bought an electric car. <laughs> Since when I've become markedly more pro-car than I probably was in the book, but never mind. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. What, was the, what was the motivation to start the book, actually? Oh, that's a, I think it tracks back a long way. Um, at the start of the book, we describe how, if anything, it were the fr mild frustrations that colour and the colour inordinately a journey, like uh, the lack of ticket machines at a train station or the fiddly things at traffic lights or the uh, experience on, a, on an airplane journey but it kind of cleaves open a much bigger category of analysis that makes you question how transport is designed and experienced. And um, I think it's fair to say Rory's got more years of transport experience than I have in usage of the, uh, uh, the network. And um, Rory, you've been prolific in talking about transport um, alongside. Yeah, I, think, I think it's really interesting for two reasons. One, I'm a bit of a transport nerd travel, transportation, leisure, hotels, all that kind of thing. Yeah. I'm just, both, both of us, I think people admit this, we're both nerdily obsessed, <laughs> okay? And we are, by the way, in that tiny minority of people who I think will actually almost try and game the system. Yeah. You know, we will invest literally 40 minutes of research into a 20 minute journey yeah. in some cases. <laughs> and I'm always the guy, <laughs> whenever they say there's a board meeting and they say, the best thing to do is to get the train to Windsor and then walk from there. I go, no, that's rubbish. You actually get a train to Reading and then take a taxi because it takes half as long. Yeah, haven't you I'm got an guy. LED board at your house, Rory? Haven't you got like a little... Uh, yes, gap? I have. I've got, I've got my own little Wi-Fi connected departure board, yeah. which shows me departures from my local station. So if the trains are running late, I can go to a different station or take mm -hmm. an earlier train. Um, so I'm that, I'm that kind of person. But then the collision with that and behavioral science becomes incredibly interesting because you realize that all the metrics that are prioritized in transport planning, investment and improvement don't really correlate very well beyond a certain point. I'm, we, I think both of us would caveat that. I'm not suggesting I'm not suggesting you go to kind of random airport airline departures where you turn up at the airport and they go, we've decided to go tomorrow. OK, uh, well, you know, but beyond a certain point, chasing the same old metrics of sort of punctuality and speed is undoubtedly comes into contact with the law of diminishing returns. Mm. And what people care about, for example, might be a sense of certainty matters much more to your emotional and mental well-being than speed per se. You know, knowing you're going to be eight minutes late actually isn't much of an inconvenience. Sitting on a stationary train with no information drives you almost insane. And understanding, by the way, what drives transport choices um, is really, really important in terms of transport planning, because transport planning involves predicting how human behaviour will change in response to transport investment. And if you think, oh, we've done a train that's faster than the car, therefore everybody will take the train and you discover that almost nobody does because what they love about the car is not the speed but the sense of autonomy 
or privacy or the ability to fart or whatever it might be, okay? Um, you can make very, very bad predictions if you assume that humans are kind of entirely rational calculating engines. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, it, it was, uh, I was just intrigued to know, is, is there, are there any stories that from, from the book that, that, you, that you'd love to share or uh, that you can share? <laughs> Any favourites? I think all of them, really. I mean, <laughs> <coughs> I love I love the point about first mile bias with <coughs> with the car. Take a moment. <laughs> Sorry, the fact that the car sits outside your house and it's the first thing you encounter, yeah, undoubtedly upweights the use of the car versus other modes of transport. It's so salient and it's so close. In other words, your car is waiting for you, as Pete put it, whereas you have to wait for a bus. Right. OK, that is, you know, regardless of the overall journey time, convenience and cost, that's yeah. a surprisingly significant factor in choice, just the order in which you have to eliminate things. An extraordinary thing happened. I'll just give you an example of this. When you arrive at Charing Cross Station, um, the first thing you come across is the entrance to the tube. Then you come across a taxi rank. And beyond that is actually about four bus ranks, okay? Yeah. The only bus information is by the time you've got to the bus rank. So mm -hmm. you have to reject the tube and reject a waiting taxi before you're even aware of what buses might be leaving. Now, if you just brought the bus information, I, I have no idea, literally no idea, uh, where the buses from Charing Cross go to. And part of the reason for that is if you just brought the information inside the station and said, effectively, you know, bus to Victoria via Victoria Street, four minutes, I go, well, sod this taxi. Mm -hmm. OK, but but what what seems to happen? And most bizarrely, you know, uh, the justification for expenditure and transport investment almost has to be predicated on time saving. Right which is crazy because our preferences aren't really driven by time and cost alone. Not that they're totally irrelevant, yeah. obviously, and we're crazy to suggest they were, but just because something makes sense doesn't mean it's, it's true. Yeah, I remember your, uh, your favourite TED talk, uh, the, the, the first one where you were, you were asking, you were saying that, what was it, Eurasia Art Star should be slowed down yep. and, uh, and use the money to serve sort of uh, supermodels serving Chateau Petrus uh, up and down the carriages. Is it, Peter, is there any way that TFL are looking into that? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I've got a commute from Peterborough, so uh, I wouldn't mind that. Uh, uh. <laughs> well, yes, funny you should say, actually, I got the DLR, uh, so part of the London Underground sort of network, uh, just last night. And I noticed that uh, for the first time I'd seen the screens printed on the sort of the glass boards, uh, surrounding the seating area had a display of sort of alpine mountain scene and rather than being given over to commercial advertising it was communicating a uh, an app that you could use on, during your journey to sit there and uh, I think there's some uh, mindfulness or some meditation and some right. special sounds that it can play thereby turning the journey into a, uh, a moment of reflection so while it's not um well, it's not fizzy grape juice uh, that we humans uh, love and adore. Um, it is a value add that really uh, appreciates some for some people the aspect uh, that the journey is not wasted time, but um, has some um, has some benefit. Yes, yeah, so I know if, my, if I'm right in saying that there, there was a. I remember when I was at Ogilvy, there was a challenge to try and see if there was a way to get internet between the stops uh, for some of the lines. Um, is that? Is that anywhere closer to being yeah, yeah. solved? Well, funnily enough, they almost solved it on the underground in credit to TfL before they solved it on the Eurostar when it was an easier problem uh, in the sense that, OK, there's mobile coverage on part yeah. of the Eurostar, but there should there should have been Wi-Fi on the Eurostar from, if not day one, certainly from about 2004. And in the event, it took them until about 2015 to install it. Now, when you think about it, anything that emphasises the usefulness and productivity of a journey is pretty decisive if you're competing with air travel. Because air travel's pretty fast, objectively. It's very fast when the plane's actually moving, which is a small fraction of your overall journey time. But the extent to which you have quality time to get on with work, or for that matter, read a book or watch a film, uh, on a short haul air travel is pretty dismal. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the point is, 
you know, this is Ricardo's law of comparative advantage. Planes have a comparative advantage in going fast. And no train will ever, I think, be able to reach airline speeds, um, perhaps not safely in any case. So what you do is very sensible. You emphasize and upweight those areas of the experience where you have a comparative advantage. And train travel in terms of enjoyment and productivity um, undoubtedly wins. Yeah, I, mean, I think well, TFL have been really good at removing uncertainty over the years. I mean, I, I remember growing up in London, you never used to have those nice boards that told you that the train is arriving in two minutes. But, I mean, the, the, the odd thing is that they have great difficulty funding those boards because they don't, in fact, change the objective characteristics of the journey. Right. So you, there's a metric, if you like, for time of journey. And time can be translated into money through a kind of slightly ludicrous assertion that all time spent in transit is entirely economically useless. That's, that's, the, that's the model they use to justify HS2 to a large extent, um, not exclusively. Yeah. Um, but um, in truth, the truth of the matter is that journey time can be a very, very high quality indeed. You know, nobody mm. ever advertises how fast their cruise ship is, do they? Um, you know, the whole purpose is what's the onboard experience like? Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, I think what's quite strange about the travel industry is even in very closely related fields of travel, people don't really borrow ideas and insights from each other very much. Right. Yeah, it makes sense. I'm, I'm, it reminded me of um, <laughs> one of your other things, Rory, that you said. I think you said the worst phrase in the English language is bus replacement service. Um. <laughs> it's amazing how much we hate that and whether you could do, whether you could rethink that in a way that we, are, we tolerated it is a really fascinating question. Part of it's unavoidable. It's just the annoyance of uh, intermodality. And Pete, Pete's wonderful on this. Uh, there are several things that Pete, know, uh, from his transport and social geography experience, knows. Uh, you know, one of which is changing from one mode to another is disproportionately stressful, regardless of the duration or the time it takes. It's disproportionately annoying. You also have that brilliant three-way model, didn't you? Which I found really useful. Which I think comes from the University of Leeds. Is that right? Which is connectivity and its place. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this you, would be all this credit. Is worth knowing, um, everybody. While while uh, while the University of Leeds certainly are leaders in transport studies, um, the University of West England. Oh, you're uh, right. The Welsh, uh, yeah. Glenn Lyons uh, wrote a very nice uh, piece five years ago or so that we found really helped reframe transport in its uh, proper course in the sort of behavioural and psychological and social setting, which is to say, let's think of what problem transport is solving it's solving an access to people and services and opportunities problem it does so by moving a body a human from a to b give by and large um, but there's other ways people can overcome their problems uh, their transport problems through digital connectivity and through uh, local proximity and we've seen in many ways the coronavirus pandemic has shown what's happened when you cut out one of those three nodes on our triangle you reduce people's ability um, to travel by saying essential travel only or, or by reducing it even more dramatically uh, and people find ways to uh, solve their sort of travel needs by other means so so by connecting like we are um, on video but it goes deeper on online shopping and it clearly involves um, using local services which is a small amount of transport let's say but um, um very local things um uh, make a big difference so this is where some of the big transport solutions that are coming in the coming years aren't necessarily transport um but they're the things around transport so video conferencing patently and the normalization of video conferencing reduces a large part of our need to travel certainly for commercial purposes and sometimes for social purposes it's worth noting by the way the book contains thanks to pete rather than me some pretty interesting statistics I and mean, the fact that the uk has already reached peak car I mean, nearly all projections are based on the assumption that car use will increase. Car use and ownership, I think, has been declining in the UK for some years. One reason, obviously, you can say, well, there's the Internet, there's Amazon. 
But there's also actually the fact, which I think probably doesn't get factored into models nearly as much, as you'll know, living in Stanford, which is that provincial towns actually aren't that crap anymore. <laughs> OK, I mean, it's a fa- it, it, I mean, this is one of the things I, one of the things I think is really important is having the courage to say things that, that are seemingly banal, yeah. but which are nevertheless important. In the sense that I, you know, I grew up in, I mean, Monmouth, lovely town, okay, local yeah. town, no complaints about growing up in Monmouth. But if you wanted to buy an interesting piece of hi-fi equipment or you wanted to buy strange coffee or exotic foods, you had to go somewhere else. Right. And actually, what we've got now seems to be a retail ecosystem and a coffee shop ecosystem where once you reach a reasonable critical mass in a town, then by the Pareto principle, 95% of your daily uh, quotidian wants and needs are fairly well sorted. You know, it's rather like that finding, if you think about it, which is that in a Tesco Metro, you actually have 90% of the shit you need, okay? You know, okay, you can make the Tesco into a Tesco Extra, in which case it's the size of a Hindenburg hanger, and it will end up with something like 50,000 SKUs rather than 5,000. But since most people are mostly buying the same kind of stuff most of the time, and you know, a Tesco Metro will actually do you proud, um, you know, eight shops out of nine. And yeah. so what, what I think has happened in the sort of both small cities have become much, much better. I mean, I went to Manchester in uh, 1989. And it was a complete waste of time, to be absolutely honest. I wasn't into the music scene, admittedly. But I mean, you know, I, I mean, you, if you went to Manchester in 1989, you couldn't wait to get back to London. If you go to Manchester now, you're slightly envious of the inhabitants. <laughs> and so, you know, those factors to which people respond um, are worth bearing in mind. And, and, and this wonderful University of the West of England model basically includes them. It says, you know, transport isn't necessarily an end in itself. It's a means to an end. Um, and I, actually, there are alternative substitute goods that can satisfy for that need. I mean, it's going to be fascinating. I mean, you, you wrote this book at a really interesting time. So, I mean, you know, we've moved out from London into the countryside purely because the transport link from here, luckily, is relatively good into London. You can be in London, King's Cross, and sort of... Well, why did you go from Peterborough, not Stamford? I had to ask that because that's the kind of question Pete and I ask. So, um, from, uh, so I'm in Stamford, but literally about two minutes down the road is a train that takes 12 minutes to get to Peterborough. And then ah. from Peterborough, I can get a, a fast train, which is about 45 minutes to King's Cross. And apparently, they're making a fast station that's going to be half an hour um, which would be oh, pretty sort of parkway station are they I, I don't know what it is but they're oh, interesting they're, uh, it should be interesting yeah they're, they're all those sort of new um lner uh azuma trains as well so they're all very nice it's, um, mm-hmm. it, the, the issue that is frustrating i guess is the is the cost um it, it's it sort of costs way less to drive down to london still than it does to get on the train which is mildly annoying <laughs> So it's, it's sort of, I would imagine that if, particularly in the UK, where you have got, it seems like you've got more people who have moved outside of the UK during COVID. Um, it'd be interesting to see, uh, you know, how that, how that works with... Well, the, the economics change, of course, what will need to happen is that the season ticket will need to be replaced with more alternatives. Right. And I personally favour a kind of Amazon Prime arrangement because I think that would guarantee reasonably regular use. In other words, you pay an annual or six monthly or three monthly lump sum, and then you get discounts on all the tickets so that regular users end up being quids in. Right. Um, And um, I think think what's interesting, of course, is that the equation for moving out of London changes quite a bit if it's a three day commute rather than five, because you, if you like, you get four days of countryside rather than two. Um, at the cost of three commutes rather than five. So both both the benefit and the cost shifts to moving out. And so you do get two forces in a sense operating in the same direction. Um, That is if you want to move out. Um, I'm not suggesting that large cities will lose their appeal. Young people particularly seem to like them. Fairly obvious Darwinian reasons, I suspect. Um, but um, it might be a case, I and mean, some, some people have said this would be desirable, that London becomes slightly scuzzier, slightly younger, and quite a bit cheaper. Yeah. That, you know, you might argue that there are a lot of people that living there who, you know, frankly, 
um, you know, would be possibly happier living outside, thereby freeing up affordable property for the people who need to be there or actively want to be there. No, I was I was chatting to um, Pete earlier actually about the book, and he was saying that there was some within the book there was some sort of quite good call to actions for um, you know there was some call to actions for for the behavioural science community um, looking at transport. There's some call to actions for the transport industry themselves, and there's some call to actions for the um, commuters themselves. I wondered if, if any of yes. you wanted to talk to any of those points. Mm. I mean, I'm just starting to agonise that maybe we... I always worry about the extent to which fashion has on belief. And there tends to be an assumption, one, that futurism and urbanism are the same thing, and that the future will always consist of people living in high-density housing in megacities. And I'm just uncomfortable about that. My argument for that is that there's a big difference between a city and a megacity. Right. In that in a city, let's say you work in the middle of Newcastle, you can be as urban or as rural as you like. You know, you could you could go and live in Northumbria and still commute in feasibly. When you reach megacity levels, you become so goddamn big that actually urban areas encompass your effective radius of operations to some extent. And you're almost forced to live in a city even if you don't want to. And I think you get a level of unwieldiness that you simply don't have in a Bristol or a Newcastle or a Liverpool or e even a Manchester or Birmingham to some extent. And the other thing I'm uncomfortable about uh, is the assumption, not necessarily that public or shared transport is going to be big, um, but the assumption that necessarily uh, the future of transport is effectively some form of mass transportation. Right. I'm, I'm unsure. The only point I make is there's no form of mass transportation where you can sit on the seafront in the rain and have a thermos full of coffee while looking at the waves. OK, that to some extent, whatever you think about the car, it's kind of like a, an extension of your house, which is able to move. And that my interesting question is, I think young people will will delay getting cars much later. Um, my only problem is that once you have a car, it's quite difficult to go back because it resets your expectations. <sighs> Which electric car did you get quickly, Rory? I, I got the Mustang Mach E, actually. Oh, no. Nice. Uh, but I was hugely, I was, I, I borrowed it. I borrowed one for four days and was just absolutely captivated. Mm. And I didn't quite want to get a Tesla because I don't want Californians deciding every single aspect of my life. You know what I mean? But I, don't, I don't want sort of effectively 30,000 people in Palo Alto designing the world for me. Mm. You know, so a little bit of Detroit you know, comes in welcome there, I think. Look how far we've come that uh, buying a Ford is an act of rebellion. Right? I know, it's that extraordinary. Yeah, I know, I was thinking that. <laughs> uh, Chris, you asked a question, quite a direct question there about their addressing the th sort of three audiences, if you like, and um, yeah, taking them in turn. The book is uh, it tries to set out a really neat argument for a, an optimistic case for transport planners to look carefully at their own think of themselves as human and all the decision making biases you might have as you think about problems um to really encompass all the humanity and the heuristics and biases and principles i think a lot of uh, listeners of this podcast will be well versed in um but there's a there's a challenge for behavioral scientists really to to be to be ready and waiting on the journey to make research really accessible and really usable and to step up to the plate and say okay what's it worth to have a better table on the seat what's it worth to have cleaner windows what's it worth to have abundant charge points for your evs because these things can't just be invested in under the hope that they're user-centric they say some of these are it's this or this and how much should we invest in it and how much do we need to reach certain tipping points and behavioral scientists need to step up and do that and the final audience of which everyone that reads the book is ultimately uh, engages in transport themselves and we hope it just allows people to think differently and the course of writing this book has really been instructive that you can take different mental models to different journeys sometimes it's about making it speed uh, sometimes it's about hassle free sometimes it's about um looking out the window um so being dogmatic about any one model doesn't work for for any given individual either so we, we hope I, 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 th I think there's also a further benefit to acknowledging human diversity there which is that um, one of the dangers of designing for the average 
is first of all, it contains the assumption that kind of if you imagine an average person and you optimize it for them, then the solution will be optimal. But there are lots of transport networks where actually appealing to diverse people in diverse ways would make the network much more effective. For example, the tube, because you wouldn't get everybody trying to make the same journey in the same way. And therefore, the use of the network would be more diverse and hence the network overall would be more efficient. So the classic case we give is the central line is overused because it's red on the tube map and it's a straight line going from right to left, east to west or west to east. And so it's immediately salient and obvious as a way of getting from west to east. Now, if you could actually nudge 20 percent of people into going, actually, as Pete says, you know, the circle line, it's slower, it's 12 minutes slower, but it's air conditioned and, you know, it's not so deep down or whatever. OK, then actually, rather than building another east-west railway to cope with demand, what you'd simply do is disperse demand. Mm. And I, it, it's something I think I, I think we need to understand much better in terms of both complexity thinking and network theory, which is actually to make a whole efficient. You don't want everybody doing this. Optimizing for everybody in the same way does not lead to an efficient use of a transport network. It'd be interesting to have uh, different versions of the London tube map, depending on what well, you wanted to optimize very, for. That's very quick, because um, this is one of, our, one of the suggestions in the book, uh, um, is exactly, but also you could just randomize the tube map. I mean, that's another yeah. perfectly reasonable argument, but you certainly could have a tube map, which is a tube map for the um, claustrophobic, yeah. for yeah, example. Uh, you could certainly have a tube map for people who, you know, who, who want air conditioning. But you could also, I mean, if you think about it, the Victoria line, I think probably the best line on the whole network is because it was the last to be added to the map. It goes in a stupid curve. OK. Yeah. And so it's not very salient what the Victoria line does. And so I'll give you an example. I used to take taxis from Victoria to Euston. OK, which take bloody ages. All right. Because I'd actually effectively lived in and around London for about 16 years before I realized there was a tube line directly from Victoria to Euston. It's on the goddamn map. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I have to take some blame myself. But if you're looking for a direct path from Victoria to Euston, no one's looking for, to do a really circuitous route arcing round to the west which is what the, the line on the map, it's actually a straight line in reality. It's complete, I think it's a pretty straight tube line, certainly very, very fast. But the map completely distorts human preference. So how you present information affects what people do, regardless of what else is going on. Mm. Okay. And there's a nice thing to build on there, I suppose, would be that, I mean, some transport planners might say, oh, that sounds like a great utopian future where everybody's dispersed, but really, people ultimately care about speed and cost don't they and we say well there is some interesting data when you look at something in this case tfl did where the wi-fi routers they installed along platforms inadvertently allowed them for the first time to see how people moved within the network where the data previously just showed where people tapped in and tapped down it turns out when you map it out actually a minority of people take in, in an example that they gave from Liverpool Street to Victoria, there's several options you could take of different lines, and this would be true in lots of cities. Um, not even a majority of people actually chose the fastest route. Some of them did take the circle line. Some of them did take the quick central and Victoria line. Some of them went the wrong direction, and we would love to know why. So <laughs> people are already dispersing. Uh, we just don't know enough about why they're dispersing. So we're quite open to the times where show us the research that says cutting the journey time would in, would increase ridership and preference and we're we're quite agnostic to that it's just uh in the absence of that research we say shouldn't we be creative and a bit imaginative about um i I, th I think interestingly the center for economic and business research have reliable data that shows that people don't try and live as close to the offices or their workplace as they can that there is actually if you if you factor in everything else you realize that there's a weird preference for having a kind of distance between where you work and where you live. Yeah, makes sense. But, uh, I, know, yeah. Um, I know that we're almost out of time. So, I mean, the, the book launches on the 18th of uh, November. Right. 
uh, and it's called Transport for Humans. Are we nearly there yet? I love the byline, by the way. Um, and it's available on Amazon or any good bookstore uh, you go to. I think you can actually pre-order it. You can pre-order it, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, get in yeah. there. And, and just to finish off, what, what's your favourite commute, uh, Rory and Pete? What, what the favorite journey or favorite yeah, regular journey? Probably your favorite regular journey, I think, fits probably more oh, with I, I, this. I've got, a, I've got a wonderful example of this, actually, which I take about half the time, uh, which is I travel into work from near Seven Oaks to Blackfriars by going to Otford and deliberately taking a very slow stopping train. <laughs> and the reason I do that is if I don't have to be there sooner than an hour, I have about 58 minutes. I can do the journey in about 35, but I have 58 minutes on a less crowded train where I can always work for the whole duration and I have a better Wi-Fi signal and I also have time to get shit done, which I don't have if I take the faster route where I have to take change trains. And it's a bit more scenic in addition. Oh, nice. So that, that's an absolutely classic example where... Um, a, a bunch of other preferences, not all the time, but some of the time, uh, I'm very willing to sacrifice speed uh, just for bizarrely a slower journey, but one that's slightly more convenient and productive. That's great. Tip. Interestingly, I don't so often go home that way, which is possibly revealing, which is that I'm, you know, maybe on the way home, I just want to get home. But on the way to work, my argument is I'm going to be working anyway. So it doesn't make much difference whether I'm working on a train or... And funnily enough, until I mentioned this, it never occurred to me that I make that journey much more frequently in one direction than I do in the other. I'm sure there's uh, some psychiatry, some psychiatrist would have some words about that. <laughs> no, no, it kind, of, it kind of does make sense when I think about it, yeah. which is there's a gain to getting to... Uh, there's a gain to getting home sooner, whereas there isn't a gain to getting to work sooner if you're mm -hmm. working anyway. So I suppose that logic kind of makes sense in a way. I think also it's, it's you've got your your own me time to actually yeah you know not surrounded by other people who are going to distract you. So yeah, it's, uh, it's handy to do that in the morning. Oh, and also the parking's a bit easier there and a bit cheaper. So it's a whole it's a whole concatenation of factors. Yeah. And this fact that actually uh, you know what's what people are trying to do is create this model of human mobility, as Pete says, which is predicated on the movement of goods where no emotional factors obviously pertain. You know, as, I, as we said, you know, you don't get a chair that has a fit of peak because it's sent by FedEx, not UPS, okay? Um, you know, goods are not fundamentally emotional things. Their perception of time is, well, nil, but I mean, our perception of time with the arrival of goods is fairly predicated on speed. Although even there, you could argue that online package tracking provides certainty which compensates for slower speed, I would argue. Yeah. 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 You asked Chris favourite journeys. I've had a good time <laughs> to think. And um, yeah, taking the train just out of London and cycling the rest of the way uh, to visit my family and my parents who live a bit further out in a perfect mix of, uh, well, uh, for the geeks, a C2C service that comes very regularly. You can tap in and tap out. You don't plan that train journey. You can take your bike on it and then you cycle another, in my case, an hour. So a fair way. But through some journey for about four pounds, you get a fitness workout. You get 20 minutes on the train um, and you get to your destination. It never really felt like travel yeah. uh, or it never felt like a chore. But for those who haven't met Pete before, you're a, you're a sort of semi-professional iron man so i'm guessing now no, no, that's, that's me that's me you've got us muddled yeah, up. right yeah, 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 yeah you got up. us muddled up and confused again <laughs> <laughs> is that is that your next collaboration rory with pete is uh, yeah yeah book on tri book, book on the triathlon yeah i think you pete you were saying that you uh, you also you broke the record didn't you from sort of land's end to somewhere i cycled from land's end to so the tip of cornwall of england back to london which is an established sort of national point-to-point -point record distance of about 290 miles and did so in in one fell swoop in 11 hours and 50 minutes i think um i was stationary for about 12 minutes my gps says so um wow. it was uh it was quick it still wasn't quicker than the train or even the sleeper train um <laughs> i took a lot of planning either side so it's not really a mode of transport i hope you um, took a pee when you were stationary did you 
Yes, yeah, yeah. there was. Yeah, and, um, think. But Otherwise, it goes, it's an iron bladder competition. <laughs> <laughs> it does go to show the, yeah, the wonderful efficiency and effectiveness of the, this bicycle, which uh, amazes me and many others that was actually invented after the train, is only 130 odd years old, um, came only just before the car, and yet um it's still ha it's having a resurgence not least because a little bit of extra technology in the case of a electric battery electric motor um transforms its efficiency such that in the future perhaps even rory could um could break the record that, and that <laughs> is actually uh, the electric bike is highly interesting i think as a you know mm -hmm. as one of the new technologies we'll have to explore um and i think um uh, I, I think also electric vehicles are kind of interesting because one of the things I've discovered having one is it changes the way you drive and it makes you much more zen. Because if someone slows down in front of you, they haven't actually robbed you of your kinetic energy because of regenerative braking. And so surprisingly, it makes you a remarkably chill driver. Well, thank you so, so much for your time. I know you've got to go, so I'll leave you it's to it. It's a huge um, pleasure. Yeah, please, uh, please do everyone go out and buy the book. And uh, yeah, looking forward to reading it myself. So uh, bravo again. Congratulations to you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank, Thank you, Chris. You're very kind. Bye.